morning. Bill's joined us at 5.30, yes, but it's 6 o'clock in the morning now um, out there in the States, and we'll start to see daylight coming through behind him as the day progresses. So thank you for getting up so early in the morning, Bill. Uh, pleasure, pleasure. Um, just before we start, the Systems Thinking Summit is going to be on October the 8th and 9th in Cardiff, um, and it's going to have some of the world's most eminent system thinkers including keynotes from Professor Dave Snowden, um, Dr. Bill Bellows, who's here today, Dr. Emma Langman, and um, about nine or ten other speakers who will be interviewing in the run-up to the summit. Um, and you'll be able to get both masterclass level talks at the summit and introductory sessions for people who are just starting to learn about systems thinking. Uh, so. As I'm going to be doing the host role on the day, I always talk to people before beforehand to find out a little bit about them. So it just seems sensible to record those so that you guys can find out who's going to be uh, coming to the summit and and who you want to see when you attend. Um, so so let's start and talk to Bill. Um, so Bill, you're uh, you work for Pratt Whitney, oh, Pratt Whitney Rocket Dine in California. Uh, what do you do there? Yes, I do. I work for Pratt Whitney Rocket Dine. I've been here for 22 years. I work with engineers who design and build and uh, design, develop, and build rocket engines. And my role in the organization is helping them think about their thinking. So you you're helping rocket scientists how to think, as as we've got as our tagline. Yeah, I uh, it's I explained to our daughter a few years ago. She was funny. We were listening to something on the. On the radio about um, rockets and missile defense, or some short piece, and she says, "Dad, do you do you design those rockets?" And I said, "No, I don't design the rockets." Well, then, do you do you build those rockets? And I said, "No, I don't build the rockets." Well, in both cases, kind of like wanted to be proud that her father designed or built the rockets. I said, "No, I I work with the engineers who design and build them and help them think about them to make them better." Which I don't know what it meant to her, but it's uh, you know I help them literally. I help them think about their thinking, and I'm not sure that there's um, anyone with a role like this. Well, it sounds really interesting, but you don't just work with with very clever people. You also do all sorts of other things, including an after school program. You work For a while, I was doing an after school program. Yeah, I um, spent uh, several years doing an after school program for kids <clears throat> that were um, what we would call elementary school. Um, they were 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. And what I was doing there was um, exposing them to ideas I thought were relevant to them. I did that for two years, and prior to that, um, and this is all part time. And then prior to that, I worked with uh, graduate students for four, year, four years at Northwestern University Business School. And, uh, and after that faded, I took up the after-school program. And, uh, but in either case, I'm looking at different audiences, trying to present ideas appropriate to them to improve my understanding and, 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 uh, as well as their understanding. So it's, it's accessible to people with all levels of knowledge, understanding, and education levels, effectively. Well, that's, 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 that's my challenge. My challenge is to take a given set of ideas, refine my understanding of them, and then look for ways to present them to audiences that are quite diverse. And, and so literally, I've explained them to um, a four-star general. Um, and her, she invited me to speak at an event that led to an invite to the Pentagon to explain it uh, people on her staff. And I've explained it to, you know, third and fourth graders. <laughs> so it's, it's um, and I just, you know, I've been to the UK many, many times. I've explained it to city councils um, across the UK. And and the issues are the same. They're fundamentally the same. And, and, and the audiences don't know that. The audiences think what they see, what goes on where they are, is normal. And, and they don't they don't study across. They don't know that all the villages are pretty much running the same way. Uh, and I didn't know that when I started, but I definitely see wherever I go, that's when I see um, 
And and so the issues are the same, the opportunities are the same. Brilliant. And you also, um, I've got down here um, the into the Intuin Thinking Networking Conferences that you that you are you president of Intuin. Yes, yes, we we started the Intuin Thinking Network uh, summer of 2000 as a as an organization to host a an annual four day event where people could get together face to face and mind to mind. And we started with a volunteer team of maybe three dozen friends, and, and that volunteer team has um, grown to about 50 people, and our annual forum has been conducted 11 times. And, that's, you know, and our objective is to use the ideas that were, you know, in, in terms of thinking about thinking, to coordinate the activities and which which allows us to do more with extremely less and then simultaneously get people together you know for an event that yeah you know, we hope is is so significant to them that they have to come back excellent so so if people who are watching this in the states that can't make it to the summit in october can catch up with you in it's april time isn't it that you do the the interim thinking well we've had a yeah you know, we've been doing it in april and we've recently announced plans to move the event to uh, nearby Cal State University uh, College. And we're, in order to accommodate our guests with housing, um, we're going to move it to mid June and we're going to use the dormitories for housing. So it's, we're shifting it a little bit to the right. And we've changed the format from a six day event to a five day event. And we're uh, Moving along, and, and it looks it's very exciting. We're we're going from one venue, which is uh, you know rooms without a lot of windows, to an open setting with with grass and light, and it's uh, um, you know the college. Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's going to be it's, it's going to be very exciting. I'm hoping to make it out there next year, so my first experience will obviously be the new experience. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, it's going to be it's going to be exciting. Excellent. Um, so, is there anything else? Any of anything else about what you do you'd like to, to tell us about before we get into talking about the summit? I know you've got well, fingers in many pies. No, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and talk about the summit. Cool, excellent. Um, so, you're doing the first keynote speech at the summit um, with the title of "In Thinking for Purposeful Resource Management." Uh, can you give us a bit of a flavour about what you'll be talking about? Sure. The the title gets to the essence of what I started to focus on in the early 90s when I was started focusing on continuous improvement, which to me meant making taking something which is good and making it better and then better, or, you, or you'll hear a language which is you know faster, better, cheaper, and things are viewed in a relative sense of then again faster, then again cheaper. And, and even I remember in 1996 uh, when the Olympics, the summer games were held in Atlanta, I noticed that the Olympic slogan, I think it's Citius Altius Fortius, which is higher, faster, stronger, or something like that. Maybe I got the words reversed. And I thought it was kind of cool that, that this relativeness was built into the Olympic saying Yet what I see that goes on in organizations, most organizations, is good, fast, tall. <laughs> so it's not relative, it's this is good. And, um, and, and this affects how we manage resources. And so what I did not see us doing a lot of in organizations relative to how we manage resources is focus on how to make things faster, better, stronger. I'm not saying that that's always a need, but I found us stopping at good, stopping at fast, stopping at strong, and 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 the idea behind purposeful is is deliberately asking should it be faster, should it be stronger, and not stopping where we are. It's just having that conversation as I'm sharing it with you. Is that a bit like we use the phrase in the UK a lot of best practice? So it's go out and find out what's best practice and then do that rather than better practice. 
So we always think about what's the best thing that's here now, let's emulate that, rather than what's better practice and better practice as the next thing that we do. It, 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 definitely, includes, it definitely includes that. Um, it begs the question, what I'd like to beg the question of um, is, are we comfortable with the current practice? Does it have to be better? And, and then realizing that what is best is always relative. And um, I was having a conversation yesterday with some friends in, and the comment was about you know how things change. And, and what I was anxious to say is repeat is a, is a, is a phrase that Dr. Deming used, which is knowledge is temporal, which is the best we know is the best we know right now. And that there is not an absolute best, but that, uh, that it's always relative. And this is where you know, we can think about you know systems, is that there's always a context for what constitutes best. And where the in thinking piece in the title comes from, and we coined that phrase, few of us coined that phrase in 2000 time frame, is that if we think about our thinking, then we become aware of the difference between viewing things as relative and viewing things as absolute and realize the holes we get stuck in when we say best practice and we realize that what we call best practice I would say is, is, is small letter B best not capital letter B best because this capital letter B best it implies that this is the best you'll ever see that there isn't anything beyond that and that gets into Phrases like, you know, perfection, and and I like to tell people you you if I see two definitions of the term perfection, um, you'll see about you'll hear, you know, that in the pursuit of perfection, which to me sounds like very distinctly what I hear is we're searching for the best, so that's capital T, the capital B best. And once we've found it, you can't go beyond it. And the other context of perfect is I go into a hardware store and I'm asking for something. And then, and then you as the person showing me around says, is this what you're looking for? And I say, perfect. Well, that perfect means that what I have in mind is what you have. It doesn't mean it's the overall best. It means that there's a match there. So in one case, perfect means exactly what I'm looking for. In the other case, perfect means the pinnacle, you know, the Mount Everest, and there is not another another Mount Everest anywhere. So you have found the, you know, the summit, and I find that context presumptuous. <laughs> and and there, I remember in the early '90s, you know, when these ideas were coming to me, and I saw the relativeness and the Olympic slogan. I also saw it at the Disneyland Hotel of a quote from Walt Disney that said, Disneyland will never be completed. It'll continue to grow as long as there's imagination in the world. And it's because of that I'm thinking, if you think this is best, <laughs> it's only best if everyone in the world stops thinking. And, and, I, and I would never want to guess that that would happen. But then it's the best experience for every four-year-old or whatever that goes to Disneyland for them right now when they experience it. As long as, clarify, as long as we clarify the right now. Yeah. And, and, and so imagine an environment where when we use terms like best, we all know in the environment that it's lower, that it's small letter B, which means it's, you know, that's all we need right now. We are content with that, that we're not in search of the overall best, only to be surprised to realize that someone found something better. I said, why would, we, why would you be surprised? But then the question becomes, going back to the purposeful is, is how much better does it need to be? And a big part of that is how much time are we willing to spend? And, and that's the resource management piece is, you know, we can spend a lot more time and a lot more energy, and is that appropriate? So it's, is it, you talk about the Olympics earlier as reminded me of the stories about the four-minute mile which was going to be impossible 
uh, and then once one person broke it, people could get faster and faster because that belief that the pinnacle hadn't been reached was whether they believed you couldn't do something that we'd reach the best that we could do when somebody broke through that barrier you could keep going and get better and better times again yeah it's um it's realizing that that the four minutes was an illusory barrier and it, and it's not so somebody could say well then do you think people are going to run a three minute mile well, and the one thing I would say I wouldn't bet against it, but to look at it as a system, perhaps we can look at the training of athletes in that in order to achieve a, a, a three-minute and 50-second mile, um, perhaps that can be done with less training. Perhaps it can be done without occupying their entire life between Olympics, which also makes it – so the faster, better, cheaper is not just they run faster – it's that they can accomplish that task, you know, with fewer resources. Yeah. And I look at it that way. So maybe the output cannot be improved upon enormously. Now we look to see, okay, can you know, can I maintain a normal lifestyle and and still be an Olympic athlete? And, and years ago, you may have found, you know, perhaps athletes just trained, you know, every day, and 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 then with with changes in how we think changes which bring about new technologies, perhaps that can be done with with less effort, which is which again goes back to in the purposeful resource management, you know, can an organization or an individual accomplish more with less or or similar for less um, and at least be able to have those conversations. And is that what you're going to be talking about in your three-hour workshop on day two that's beyond more with less? Is that you'll be going into that aspect of things more deeper in that, will you? Yeah, the, the ideas I present in both settings will be, will be very similar. The difference, in the, the difference will be a format, whereas the, the keynote will be a great number of ideas presented, you know, in that hour and a half of Q and A, and presented with pictures and PowerPoint, but not as interactive as the three-hour session. So the three-hour session will not be a lot of pictures and PowerPoint, and most likely will not be PowerPoint at all. It'll it'll be entirely interactive and and experiential, which is a different way to absorb the information. So so. The sort of delegates that that would be really useful for are the people who want to understand how what you've said in the keynote relates to them and explore it for themselves in more depth. That's exactly what I see doing, and I've done this before. So the role of the keynote is to present a number of ideas that will hopefully, you know, shake you, and then the role of the second day is to get into why you said something yesterday. Can I help? You know, help me understand that better, and and so what I do in the you know the formats of the of the keynotes is try to present as a broad set of a fundamental set of concepts in a broad enough way that depending on where you are and what you do, I can I can present something which is relevant to you, whether you work in information technology or rocket engines or public policy, that. There, it is so broad what gets covered, you realize, geez, he said something which is relative to me. Not all that was relative, because I didn't understand that aspect, but there was, you know, something for everyone. And then come back the next day, and, and then when people realize that we essentially all work in the same company. Yeah. I say my personal experience of, of hearing you speak, which was, was it last year that you came and spoke at Net2? Yeah, it was uh, just a... Yeah, um, a little less than a year ago at Brickhouse. Yes, um, and I came away with that, from that actually really quite pissed off because you changed my thinking so much that I couldn't remember what I thought before. So oh, I couldn't, I couldn't acknowledge the change because I knew there was a change, but I didn't know what it was. Um, well, that was no, that was that was a monumental session for me <laughs> as well. <laughs> It was really, really good session for me, and in terms of very practical, simple ways of 
illustrating concepts that could be quite hard to grasp hold of. I think that was one of your skills at that session. Well, the one thing I was, what, what made that um, an extraordinary session, I mean, I presented at Brickhouse before, so it might have been the third or fourth time I've been to the Kirkdale Training Center in Brickhouse. And we had in the session you were in maybe 20 or so people there, and a number of whom I've, I've met before. I hadn't met you before, but um, you know Paul and Emma had met before. Um, but two people in there, uh, my wife and daughter, I've met before. And what's, what's funny is our daughter, who's now 22, has attended a number of times. Uh, I first exposed her in a, in a seminar when she was nine years old, eight years old, I brought her with me to Chicago, Northwestern's Business School, and, and several weeks later, she was definitely touched by some of the things I said, more so about the context aspect, and, uh, and she was asking questions. Of, she was working on a science project, and she was in elementary school, and every year they have a science project, and, and there's two aspects of the science project. One is you, you work in a science project, and the other aspect is you create a display for, for a presentation. And she was working on the project, and then later she was going to work on the display. And we were pursuing the, you know, why is there a display? And what I was probing on is getting to realize the role of the display is for her to share what she learned with others. But I was just asking, you know, so why do you do this, and why do you do this, and why do you do this? And, and she turned to me at eight years old, and she says, these are just like the, stu just like the questions you ask your students at Northwestern. <laughs> <laughs> and all they were about is just gathering context. You, why do we do what we do the way we do? Well, the, the other aspect of the session I mentioned, my wife was there, and I presented that seminar you were in um, over 600 times. In fact, by the end of, by mid-September, I'll have offered it 700 times and roughly two dozen times across the UK. Well, my wife was attending for the very first time, and and it was it's kind of awkward to look out in the audience and you you're making eye contact with people you don't know, then people you do know, and it's kind of it's just odd to look out and make eye contact across the room with your wife, and so afterwards I said, so so what'd you think? And she says, I liked it. I learned a lot. She says, I've I've heard I've heard many of those stories before, but never woven together the way you wove them. And I said, oh, cool. And uh, so you liked it. She says, yeah, I learned a lot, and I realized that where I work is highly dysfunctional, just as you described. <laughs> and she works in, a, um, in, a, in an education setting. We'll just, we'll just say that. I mean, so she doesn't, you know, so it involves kids. And so she could see the parallel to where she worked, although all day long we never talked about at least explicitly, you know, um, in education system, but she could see the parallels, and and, uh, and she took action there upon you know afterwards to you know, try to bring the ideas to people she works with. Excellent. I have a huge list of questions from people who uh, who wanted to ask you things for this video, um, and there's a number of different directions I could go in from the things that you said as to where to start. Um, BT asked, um, beyond more with less, is this a plea for sort of fuzzy thinking and decision making instead of point perfection? And I think you've touched on that quite a lot. Is it? Is it? Is it a about, plea for fuzzy thinking and decision making instead of point perfection? That's good. Well, it's definitely not about perfection. At least, there I, as we discussed earlier, I'd have to ask the question and what they mean by perfection. Um, I think what what I find that drives people nuts, and, and, and it's funny. Um, my claim is the answer to every question is it depends, and that that there isn't a question you can't ask me that I can't say it depends. 
and then you say on what, and I could and I could ask, and I could state that, and so and so that makes it fuzzy because unless we agree on the context, it'll always be fuzzy. So you could say, well, I could ask you, who makes the best automobile tire in the world today, which is a question I ask people. And typically they say Michelin, Goodyear, um, they'll name a brand. And then they'll miss the point that there's a trick to the question. And some of the, some of them realize there, you know, there's a trick. I say the question is, who makes the best automobile tire in the world today? And we're, there's no doubt we're in agreement by you know, what we mean by world, what we mean by today what we mean by automobile, what we mean by tire. So I'll ask people, is, is there a question in there which is fuzzy? Is, is there a, a word in there which is fuzzy? And people typically pick up the fuzziest word in the entire question is best. And then, so, so I can ask you who makes the best automobile tire, and then you say, Bill, what do you mean by best? And I say, oh, Luis, thanks for asking. I mean best in snow. Well, that's still fuzzy because you could say, what kind of snow? And I could say, oh, um, snow like you get in the Midwest United States. Well, even that is fuzzy because the Midwest is a pretty broad range. So I could say, um, like you get in Colorado. And you could say, because Colorado is still kind of big, you could say, where in Colorado? And I could say, northwest Colorado, which is still kind of fuzzy. So we could narrow it down to... You know, become more and more specific. And then you might say freshly fallen snow or snow that's been out there. And the idea is if we don't seek clarification, better clarification on what we mean by best and what we mean by snow, then what's the chance that the conclusion we'll draw, the tire we buy will will be what we want? And even and, and that goes mind to uh Several years ago, I was presenting a full day seminar, uh, which is typically you know seven or eight or nine hours long, typically offered in two half days. And I had commented that I had recently taken our daughter to the East Coast, and she attended a seminar. And afterwards, I asked her what she learned, and and she her response was something about you know the answer to every question you ask is it depends and I said yes and so not a week later one of the attendees sends me a note and he was taken by that comment and he says um, you you seem to be quite proud that your daughter picked up that the answer to every question in life is it depends he says but what if you were to ask her does she love her mother? Would the answer still be it depends? And he's trying to, you know, you find a situation where it depends was not appropriate. All right? And I said, well, I could ask, what do you mean by love? In which case, you'd have to clarify that. So I said, there, there isn't a question you can't ask that I cannot ask there isn't a question you can ask that I can't ask for clarification, and that's the fuzziness. Because if we don't, if we don't appreciate the fuzziness, then we're operating with a belief that we're having a conversation. And yeah. I and I don't think that's always the case. I think that many of our problems come from not having clarification on the size of the system that we're talking about. And I think that's, and then you start looking at politics, you know, how often is the issue that each member of parliament or each congressman has their own system in mind that they're trying to protect? And if we could get clarity on that, then we realize that, you know, if, if we had, if we could get agreement on the same size system, in other words, is our interest the entire UK or just my, you know, local district? And the people who vote for me, then we realize that our disagreement is not coming from our interest in the UK. It comes down to how do I get reelected? <laughs> yes. 
although I'm just looking at this list of questions and thinking there's probably lots of clarification you could ask for in the questions <laughs> that I've got, so we might have to make some assumptions through the interview. <laughs> If Absolutely. that's okay with you. Oh, that's okay with me. But Emma asked, um, our friend Emma asked, um, you knew Russ Ackoff and uh, Peter Schultz. Can you tell us a little bit more about them as people as well as thinkers? Sure. I, I knew Russ much much better than Peter. I, had, um, I saw Peter speak on several occasions. I had lunch with him once, had a, just a wonderful lunch with him in New York City. Uh, um, and he is, you know, kind, witty. His his book, the Leadership Handbook, is positively brilliant. And I was talking to a friend the other day, and he was looking for what would be the an ideal book to present to people in management at, at his organization as a starting point. And I said, Peter's the Leadership Handbook, I think, is the the current best way to start. I I think Dr. Deming's books could take a little, I think they're not as penetrable, but I find Peter's work to be far easier to get into. Um, and that was Very my accessible, isn't it? Very accessible to people. Yes, accessible is the right word. I find it extremely accessible. Um, and I think once you understand that, then, then Deming's work becomes more accessible. Not, not that his work is not accessible, but I think Peter's is... Is, is, a, is a bit more accessible. Um, as, as for Russ, Russ Akoff, I met Russ in 2003, invited him to Pratt Whitney Rocketdyne for two-day visits in Los Angeles every year from 2003 to 2007. And then uh, partway through there, I started to travel to Philadelphia to spend time with him and uh, got to know him pretty well and and so uh, he was an amazing person and uh, had a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with him in his office um, heard stories from him that a number of which show up in his in his book um, Memories which is a, a a very poignant account colorful hilarious account of Russ and you get a feeling of how um, how early his thinking about organizations was in place, and his and his boldness and brashness at an early age. Um, and I had dinner with him just prior to his 90th birthday. And uh, and his uh, if if the viewers haven't seen it, I would encourage them to get a copy. Look online for his article um, on turning 80, which is just delightful about um, his his sense of where he was at 80 um, you know let alone 90 so he's uh, you know he in, in the later years he got to a point where he couldn't travel to Los Angeles so I would go see him and you know and he had back pain and hip pain and uh, so how are you doing Russ and he was he was he'd be it's funny be, we'd be looking at it you know sitting across from his you know in chairs opposite sides of his desk and he says right now I feel pretty good you know in, in this you know sitting the way I'm sitting but it, if he got up it, it would hurt um, but right then and there it was fine and his mind was so his, his mind was just always moving. in fact I think it's interesting that he had he was writing a book a year and his last three books were, pu were published posthumously but the quite, latest, quite an experience meeting him then by the sounds of it. Well, the, the one comment he made the very first time I saw him speak was a published session in Los Angeles, and we were owned by the Boeing Company at the time, and there were 30 to 40 of us from Boeing went to see him that morning in Los Angeles. for It was an all-day session, and, and in the end of the day, somebody asked him a question, he says, you know, Ross, I hear what you're saying. I'm excited by what you're saying, but, but our organization doesn't seem ready for what you're saying. Is there advice you can give me on, 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 on how I would go putting your ideas into practice? It seems like I need to wait until things are ready. 
And his response was so profound. He says, you have to start where you are. And what really struck me by that is, and I always believe that is, as long as you think you have to wait for the person across the aisle or someone else to take action, then you've come up with a reason not to take action yourself. Yeah. And if everyone feels that way, then nothing moves forward. And what I saw with Russ's very simple comment is, if you don't take action, who will? Which links in with a question somewhere in here. Um, Dave asked, what have you found to be the most effective methods when attempting to influence people to adopt system thinking in their day-to-day -day activities, and why do you think they are effective? I think the... I like to do thought experiments, and, it, and, um, and the thought experiments involve creating a realization that we are that we are all systems thinkers. The only the only difference between us is the size of the system we think about. And I like to so instead of trying to convince people about the benefits of systems thinking. I like to focus on how we already think in ways that are systemic and then look at what prevents us from looking, you know, seeing, seeing more. Um, I wrote an article once and I compared three systems thinkers, two of whom are very well known and considered to be profound systems thinkers. Um, one is Carl Sagan, uh, the late um, cosmologist from Cornell University, who is famous for talking about um, you know billions and billions of galaxies. And he was asked once, "How do you make an apple pie?" And his response was, first start with a universe." And I thought that was cool. And then there is um, an American naturalist, uh, John Muir, who lived in the late 19th century, and he was famous for saying, at, at, at some point you realize that everything you touch is connected to everything else, which is not too far off from what, from what Carl Sagan was saying. And then there's our son, Wilson, who was making a grilled cheese sandwich, actually trying to explain how to make a grilled cheese sandwich to our daughter when he was about nine years old and, and she wasn't quite sure how to make a grilled cheese sandwich and it, he knew it was his favorite lunch and and so he set a plan to explain to her how to make it and later on in the afternoon I asked him uh, did you explain to Allison how to make a grilled cheese sandwich he says it's easy yeah he says it's easy you only need three things and I said what three things do you need he said well you need a, a bread bread butter and cheese so I said what about a pan to cook it in he says oh yeah you need a pan I says, well, what about a spatula to flip it? He says, oh, yeah, you need that, too. He says, well, what about a stove to make it on? He says, yes, you need that, too. And I said, what about the electricity to run the stove? He says, yeah, you need that, too. So I said, well, how many things do you need to make a grilled cheese sandwich? He says, a lot. <laughs> and so someone might say, well, Wilson's really not a systems thinker to think you only need three things. And I'd say, well, Carl Sagan says start with the universe. You could clearly go further than that. <laughs> and, and so I think we, we all have an ability to look at things in some natural systemic way. And we need to be mindful of the system is, is bigger, than, bigger than what we think. And that goes back to our earlier conversation is you know, every, every member of parliament is a systems thinker. But their systems tend to be their district and how long, and, and being elected next time. <laughs> so yeah. I, so going back to the question, I think if we can get agreement and I, I, at least I like to think psychologically there's great comfort in realizing that there's a 
to a certain extent, this is not a foreign concept. I think as, as long as we make it sound foreign, we make it sound like something we have to learn, I think it's far better to say we're already doing these things, and then we realize that we're, we're already naturally thinking about things in terms of systems and become aware that there's you know, something out there we can become more aware of. But I, I, I think to say that some of us, like John Muir and Carl Sagan, are systems thinkers and others aren't, I think is a disservice to all of us. Yeah. Uh, related to that, Shirley um, tweeted us to say, how can you persuade people who are used to ignoring problems to become more relaxed about making them visible? Um, and Shirley works um, in NHS estates and facilities, if that gives a little bit of context. I don't understand the question again. So, so that People who are used to ignoring problems, how do you help them become more relaxed about making them visible? So, making them visible. Visible, yeah. That would be. Well, I think the issue there is, at least what I'm guessing, is that when I see an organization, is, is first of all, there's a problem-centric focus. We, we are quicker to focus on things that are broken and making them good. And, there, and there's also a reason to believe that we didn't have any, we, we don't see an association. And because if if there was an association between me and the problem, then I would feel bad. So there is a greater sense of operating with the mindset of who screwed up, you know, um, which is also you know, a, a systems concept in that we go around thinking, you know, who elected this guy president or who elected this guy prime minister or who made this decision and I think if we could see ourselves as part of everything that goes on yeah, then the best we could do is realize that there's ignorance going on but I think as long as we want to avoid an association to the problem then, um, then not only will problems exist <clears throat> Because we won't be able to take actions to prevent them from happening, but you'll also have organizations that have, um, you know, finger pointing. So I'm, I'm surmising that the question comes from somebody who sees problems, and sees blame avoidance, and she's probably wondering how to get people to better, better see their connection. And that's, that's something I, I would. <clears throat> I mean, you know, looking forward to explaining to attendees um, through a, you know through both the keynote and the, and the longer session, but it's um, it's a very common phenomenon. Yeah, certainly one that I've experienced a lot. Um, talking about people and I guess the culture of an organisation, um, Caroline asked, "What do you think is the most important attribute a CEO should have, and why?" Most important attribute that a, C, a CEO, chief executive officer, yeah. have. <clears throat> I think to to realize I think their their role is to instill a constancy of purpose within the organization and to you know, chart a direction for the organization in terms of how it thinks and then be mindful of of how um, through no fault of his or her own um, those efforts to, you know, to foster an environment where people think together, learn together and work together will can be put off track by decisions that he makes or that he you know, that go on in the organization that, that it's, it's not a stable system so he needs to be aware of <clears throat> and be asking each day <clears throat> you know how flexible is the organization 
you know, and 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 how much nurturing is required in terms of um, the training that goes on, the reinforcement that goes on. Because around the corner, you know, is 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 a potential crisis in the organization, or a potential exciting development in the organization, and, and in either case, his or her role is to not let that um, event cause division within the organization, where where you know, and the vision could be that some look at others and say, "How did you let that happen?" or or Within the organization, there's a sense of look what we did, but the we is not inclusive, which could create division. So I would say their role is to be mindful of of, of what it takes to put in place a framework for thinking, <clears throat> and how um, you need to reinforce that. Because every day we go home we get exposed to a society where people don't think about their thinking, where blame and whatnot is is rampant. So it's not that we're not it's not that we're living in a cocoon, you know, so we can have this great environment at work and then we watch the media, you know, through the media and whatnot, interactions with with neighbors, get exposed to how other organizations work. And so the idea is that that is going on, what do I have to do at work to maintain a resolve that that's not how we want the workplace to be. Yeah. Big job then. Oh, it's, I mean, there's always a headache. It's a question of which headache would you rather have. <laughs> yes. Um, what else? Um, John emailed me, um, and this is a long question, um, so you might need me to read it twice, so if you do. Systems thinkers consider change to be emergent. Command and control expect standard processes, um, especially in large organizations with multiple sites. If we take emergent change to mean that we allow users um, to design their own work to meet customer purpose, how would you deploy large-scale change in such organizations? So the he's he's comparing two types of organizations: a command and control organization, which is based on standard work. He's he's he's, he's saying. Um, I think he phoned me to talk to me about this. He was talking about um, large organizations across multiple sites, where often use command and control and standard processes in order to make sure that they get consistent results from everybody. So if you're then trying to get people to think about doing things differently and finding the new ways of doing things, how do you balance the consistency against the letting people come up with their own design of the system? No, that's 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 a great question. It's um and what I often see is, is, is what appears to be a contradiction between those who focus on continuous improvement and, and those who focus on standard work. And so when organizations put standard work on an organization which, is, which prides itself in continuous improvement, there's a feeling of we, we, we can't be structured like that. And, and I know this within the United States was an apparent feeling, at least that I got out of reading articles and business journals, that when when the new CEO went into um, uh, 3M, which prides itself in continuous improvement and innovation, and he brought in Six Sigma quality, which which brought with it a great degree of rigor and standardization and reducing variability. There's a feeling of we can't be innovative, you know, and, and that the innovation will suffer because the innovation, you know, shouldn't be constrained by standard work and standard processes. And I thought, no, that's just that's just an organization fighting to do what it currently does, and and wanting it no different, and not realizing there's a place for standard work. And so, in an, in the environment, you know, I envision, imagine 
that everyone in the organization understands when and where standard work is necessary, which might not be applied to how we decide to go to lunch tomorrow, where we decide to go to lunch tomorrow, but it may apply to how we make particular components, you know, for you know, for a rocket engine or for an airplane, and that they then, when you know, and, and that there's an agreement in the organization, and and the, and the systemic nature is in a sense of responsibility, that those of us within the organization um, will follow standard work as our obligation to the rest of the organization but only where that makes sense and so we will have a role in that decision making process and we will see it as our responsibility to do things that way now in parallel we may experiment with how to do it differently which is you know the emergent you know, so there's some new ideas come along and we have in the organization areas for piloting new ways of doing things and then we replace the current way with a new way then that new way becomes the new standard way of doing it and so I see an environment where we at any point of time have standards in place and different aspects and some of them may never change and then elsewhere in the organization we have mechanisms for instituting new ways of doing things and the question becomes how do we weave the emergent ways of doing things into the environment of, of doing things standard and not create any sense that those who are doing standard work are in any way less important to the organization than those who are doing emergent stuff. I think they, I, I think those yeah. who want the freedom of emergent think you know, you know, I want to be creative. And I think well, but you have to be creative with a responsibility to the organization, and I wouldn't want to create any sense that those who are doing standard work are less important to the organization so I see there are respective roles and and if that is understood there's a place for both and again go back to the systemic nature is all these things are connected and only when they're viewed as independent you know, if, if they're viewed as you know we want to be independent you know, we want to be have the freedom to emerge and change well those changes have to be understood as being connected to the rest and if not they may not serve the rest and, they, and if that responsibility is not understood and I've seen this happen, I've seen people get creative and start to change things and in time their best efforts to make things better will make things worse. In fact um, I'll just you know, end, the answer, end this with a quote from Dr. Deming that I think fits really well. He says our is that we're being ruined by best efforts. And I would say in this context, it's the best efforts of those who want to be emergent in an environment that things are really connected. Yeah. I hope that helps. I think that's a brilliant answer. Thank you. Um, this one came in from Krista on Twitter, and I don't have any more detail than the 140 characters on Twitter. Um, but Krista was asking about how you coordinate business architecture, enterprise architecture, and value stream architecture from the customer's perspective. So do you see those things as different things and how you coordinate them together to give the customer the right solution, I guess? How do we say it again? That's some it, language. It, it was about business architecture, enterprise architecture, and value stream architecture from the customer's perspective. I, I don't know, I'd, I'd love to talk with her about that um, to get better clarification, but I think I think a lot goes back to the prior question is the, those architectures have to realize that they are connected and and that the Um, again, Is your experience that they do that the people who are working and coordinating and design those architectures do see them as connected, or is that a challenge helping them see them being connected? I I think in our 
I think our organizations lack a fundamental sense of connection and and I think my guess is that question is coming from an, an apparent conflict between people in an organization that are that have you know what appear to be different responsibilities or, or different responsibilities not understanding the, the the connectedness you know what I see in organizations is you know, person A does their task and hands off to person B, who 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 takes the input and does things with it and hands off to person C, who takes things from others and then and then passes them on to the next person. You know, no different than kicking the ball around around a um, around the pitch in a in a football game. Um, and and I think there's a sense of when I let go of the ball and pass it on to you, I have done all I need to do and not realizing that how the person receives the ball, I play a role in. So I think there are, I think we have a, 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 a I think our understanding of connection needs to be a lot firmer. Um, no, no different than this. If I think this fits in very well. You know, how often do we see in conversation a sense of what I say is what you hear? Yeah. And and if you don't hear what I say, then I just say, Louise, um, you you need to have your hearing checked because I know that what I said was clear to me. And and, and unless we have a sense of a conversation that what I say is not necessarily what you hear, then we realize that your ability to hear is dependent on my ability to articulate. And that's the type of connection that I, don't, that I think really needs to be expanded upon in organizations. And I think lacking that, we see issues, at least that's what I'm wondering is, to what degree might the issues she's referring to be coming from a sense of, of that communication is two way, not one way. Um, I shall, I shall find out, and uh, we can, we can, when she's watched the video, we can find out and get more, more response to that, hopefully. Um, a different Caroline and Dave have both asked questions about: Do we need to start in education? Does there need to be more systems thinking in schools and universities to? Prepare the next generation, um, or another changes in the education system that need to be made. Oh, absolutely. And there's, there's, I say we can't. I don't know at what age we start. Um, not a child psychologist, but absolutely, I think there are. This is something that we need to be more formal about. In, in education systems, I think by the time people go to work, um, I'd say that I'd, I'd say I'd say the education system is creating people who are well adapted to how organizations work because schools and organizations work the same way, and and so in a school setting, there's a sense that the student hears exactly what the teacher says. And in the work setting, there's a sense that the that the worker hears exactly what the boss says, and and the whole idea that you're learning depends on the teacher, or that the instructions depend on the explanation of the boss. In both sense, could be greatly improved. Um, not long ago, I met with some college students and talking about systems concepts, and one of them asked. Um, what was so hard for people in industry to understand systems concepts? And I, and I explained them some situations where people got focused narrowly and, and missed paying attention to things more broadly. And he, and he thought that was, um, he was shocked by that. And I said, well, let me give you a set, let me put it in the context of a classroom. I said, is it likely that you're learning is affected by the questions that your classmates ask. And he said, yes. I said, is it likely that your learning is affected by how well the book is written? And he said, yes. 
and says, is it likely that your learning is affected by how well the teacher presents a variety of examples? He said, yes. I said, well, then why do you think that you alone scored the grade? I said, when, when you're willing to realize that your learning involves you and others, and you start to talk about how we did on the exam, not how you did on the exam. And, and in fact, recently I remember, met a woman who grew up in an environment where there's a great sense of we and how we did, how we are doing. And when she entered an environment of, of how did you do, not how did we do, it really struck her as odd. And I, and I told her, I said, I, that's exactly what I would imagine. If you grow up in an environment where people are asking, how did you do on the test? How did you do on the task? Then it's, this seems pretty normal until you realize that there might be other universes where there's a greater sense of we. And so going back to the beginning of the question, I, I think we could imagine growing up in an environment where your parents ask you questions that were about that were we centered and not me centered. And so that's what I would wonder is what when could we start that conversation? It could be at the earliest conversation with the kids. Yeah. So, so is that fundamental changes to the to the education system, or is it just is it just small things? I say small things, but like changing the language from I to we. If we put a number of those small things in, is that enough, or do we need to make bigger fundamental changes? That's, that's a good question too. This is imagine you know somebody senior in an organization says, um, I, "I heard the presentation. What we're going to do now is is change Microsoft Word or whatever software we're using for creating text documents, and automatically change every use of we, every use of me to we, yeah, you know, and 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 just like." strike out the ability to use language which is me-centered and automatically convert it to being we-centered and say it's, it's not a change in software. <laughs> it's, no. it's, a, it's forcing yourself to realize that every time I use the word, you know, when I talk about, you know, somebody says, how did you do on the test? Imagine responding with, well, this is what we did. This is what we did. And it's Go back to the title of the keynote. The title is uh, and uses the word in thinking, and by in thinking we mean the ability to become aware of your thinking. And in becoming aware and working with colleagues that are likewise growing in awareness, imagine we have the ability that if I was to say, um, make make reference to what I did yesterday. You could say you mean what we did yesterday, you know, and that type of mindfulness, you know, in a, in a playful way, would reinforce this sense of seeing things as a system, and and not a bunch of parts. And I remember even, you know, meeting, gosh, ten years ago with an MD of a fairly large British company, and and he was wondering how to create a sense of teamwork in the organization but but he was also wondering is how to how to structure the parts the divisions of the organizations to create teamwork and I see it as he was trying to use a physical construct to create a mental shift and I said that the physical constructs won't create the mental shift I said what we're talking about is I said imagine me as a soccer player or, you know football player watching from the sidelines my teammates and a goal being scored, I said, at what point of time do I realize that in sitting on the sideline and resting my legs, I am allowing a teammate with more energy to be on the field? And the fact that the goal was scored was in part played because I saw myself as being too weak and pulled myself off the field. And so then I could realize that the goal was scored in part because I allowed someone else to speak. I allowed someone else to play a role. And then there's a sense of not that he scored the goal, but that we scored the goal. And if you have that mental shift of, of from me to we, then, then how we use the software 
could accentuate that, but it's not going to create that in the first place. So I think it's a really interesting challenge for people watching this to to have a to look at what they say on a day to day basis and start trying to take the word I out of it and see how it what results they get as a from doing that. We should well, this, throw that out a, as a challenge. Well, the other thing I would add to that is. If you grew up in an environment, I go back to the earlier point is, people say, well, it's human nature to say I, and it's human nature to have this observer status that I watched the goal being scored and didn't see my role in it. And I say, no, it is not human nature to do that. Is is that if you grew up in an environment where we talk about who won the game and who scored the goal that won the game, and we don't see our role in that contribution, which is the systemic thought that that you know I passed the ball, I did things, I helped out in practice yesterday. Um, imagine in a meeting a realization that my silence allowed someone else to speak, and in that way I played a contribution to the idea that came out. And I think if you grew up in that setting with that awareness, then that would be human nature. And so there's not a unique human nature. There's if you grew up in an environment of, of sensing things as being connected, then it will seem odd for it to be any other way. So what's the future of systems thinking then? What, what, what happens next? What I would like to see In, in the systems thinking communities is a movement from well and one thing that comes to mind is I'd like there to be a sense that that what you mean by systems thinking and what I mean by systems thinking and what Emma and others mean by systems thinking may not be the same thing so there is not one universal thing called systems thinking. I think what happens is, and I think as with anything, if I knew nothing about biology, and you knew nothing about biology, then we took a class in biology, we would each think, oh, I, I've studied biology. But we may not be studying the same biology. But if I never knew anything about it, it'd be an advance over what I used to know, be it biology or chemistry or physics, the next step in maturity is realizing that what you mean by biology and systems thinking may not be what I mean. And now we realize they are actual. There's, there's that it's not monolithic. That it's, there's actually different schools of systems thinking. And I think I'd like to see that appreciation. Um, what I also see. Because again, to see things more systemically, given our, our starting point based on the previous answer of a sense of me and not we, so I think we grew up in environments where to, to see things in context is shockingly different than what we're used to. And that's an amazing door to walk through to see it that way. And I think people then become really enamored with, wow, these, I, I never saw this. I say what the people ought to realize is, you can go out the front door and have that mindset, you can go out the side door and have the mindset, and, and the yard you enter is actually different, and there's more, there's more to this than that. But I think there's a, a great excitement, but I'd like to see it move beyond a sense of you and I having a conversation at a cocktail hour, and we say that um, you know we're systems thinkers. Which I'm, my concern is implies that the others aren't. <laughs> I'd like us to see systems thinking as a continuum, that there's more to it than, than this sense of elitism that we see the big picture. I'd say from a relative concept, there's a bigger and bigger and bigger thing. And so that's the maturity I'd like to see, is, is taking the awareness and then moving it to... Um, a greater systemic concept, almost like improving improvement systems. <laughs> yeah.
so we've been talking for nearly an hour and a quarter now, Bill. So probably time to 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 wrap wrap up. If people could only take away one thing from from about systems thinking from the conversation, what would you like that to be? So the one thing that people remember. I think one of the most fundamental thoughts that that we I'd like people to have is moving from an observer mindset to which is you know I am watching things go by in life and asking you know why did they make that decision why did they do that to realizing that I somehow played a role in it and 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 it's moving from <clears throat> spectator status, which is I'm watching, to observer status. And I think if we go through life seeing ourselves as participants, now we're realizing that I'm part of the solution and part of the problem. And if we go through as spectators, then we're constantly wondering how they didn't get it. And so if, if we move to a mindset of, of what can I do to help, and then seeing ourselves as part of that system, I think, which is consistent with a lot of the questions and the answers. I think that is the, I think that's a great starting point. Brilliant, thank you. Um, it's been really, really interesting to chat to you, Bill, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you in October. And I didn't thank you for your union flag on the chair either. Um, you said that was in support of the Olympics when we were talking earlier. Yes, it is. It's, a, it's in support of the London Olympics and uh, all of our friends in the UK. And uh, and, uh, and in spite of our uh, the comments made earlier by one of our presidential candidates about wondering if London was ready for the Olympics, we I, we are so excited for how well things are going. And um, and it's you know just we're just very excited, very excited for Andy Murray winning. Which brought tears to my eyes after watching him lose <laughs> in Wimbledon, and um, I just think I, I just uh, I wish I was there. It's um, so we've got the flag flying out front. Got the flag from Emma when I was visiting in late May when we watched the Olympic torch go by, and uh, we just think you guys are doing a um, a great, just a, a fabulous job. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say you. Maybe I should say we. <laughs> it's, it's being held on your continent and. Uh, and, uh, and we're very proud of what we are doing. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. And it's now daylight, so um, you'll be able to go out and enjoy your Saturday soon. So um, thank you. So for everybody watching, we'll be doing more web chats with all of the speakers over the next few weeks. Um, and you can find out about the speakers and what they'll be talking about at www.systemthinking.com. Um, and next up is Mike Parker who I'll be talking to on Tuesday the 14th of August um, about social media and systems thinking. So if you've got any questions for Mike, if you could get them to me by Monday, um, that would be brilliant. Um, you can find details of when all these web chats go online um, on the website and there's a blue box on a number of the different pages and if you put your details in there, we'll email you and let you know. Um, and if you've got questions, you can either email them to us at great.insiders at progressionpartnership.com. Um, you can tweet at Great Insiders or you can tweet me at Louise Ebry. Um, and there's also a LinkedIn group if you uh, if you search for Great Insiders on LinkedIn and we'd love to have you there as well. So thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll see you in October. Great, Louise. Thanks very much.